Hello, uh, my name is Saf, and I am a first year PA student at McMaster University. I was drawn towards sciences um, coming out of high school, and the story kind of goes is that I came to an orientation week um, before selecting which program, program I wanted to go into. And I was talking to the students there um, who were in the program, and they kind of made, they painted a picture of each program. So I applied to uh, kinesiology and I applied to sciences. And um, with kinesiology, the, the content just seems more practical. Um, it's more about the body, anatomy, physiology, more um, things that you can see in front of you. And the lab seems really interesting. There was a biomechanics lab and they had a, a force plate that um, you could step on and generate force and see the, the velocity and the different vectors. Um, and then they had anatomy labs that you would go and see actual specimens and, and whatnot. And with the sciences, it was more chemistry and physics and um, biology focus where it's kind of more theoretical and micro. So um, I think being kind of hands-on and learning on a gross macro scale is kind of what I was drawn towards. Um, and I also felt like it would give me a pretty good understanding of the human body, which was what I was mostly interested in. Um, so that kind of made me easily pick kinesiology. Um, the first extracurricular that I was part of was the McMaster dance team. Um, there was a contemporary side and a hip-hop side, or urban side, and I was on the hip-hop team. Um, I've, al I've always kind of had a love for dance. It's kind of been a passion of mine since I was young. So this was my first time actually being on a team. Um, and that, I think, shaped me a lot. Um, it put me around like-minded people who, who um, had the same kind of passion. And you don't find that often where people kind of all are together for the same reason. Um, and that reignited my, my love for, for dance, but also kind of gave me a second family um, within the team. And then in second year, I um, became a little bit more involved and tried to do a little bit more things. So I joined the McMaster Kinesiology Society as a, a second year representative. I actually, me and my cousin were both the, the second year reps. And so we were on the society and that meant we were planning events. And that was kind of my introduction into being involved um, in kind of overseeing um, things that happened within the program and organizing things for the students. And it kind of put responsibility on me. It was kind of my first um, real responsibility in university um, in terms of having a role and having tasks to complete. And um, it was my, yeah, my first introduction to that. So that was um, an interesting experience um, within itself. And then I also was a volunteer kind of throughout my university career um, at the Superhero Training Academy at McMaster, which is um, a program that pairs McMaster students with um, children or teens that have special uh, special um, needs and so with for once a week uh, for an hour you are paired with the, with the, the child or teen and you just exercise with them and uh, promote you know healthy living and active lifestyle and if you know if they're younger then you just kind of just play games with them and um, if they're older then you kind of lead them through an actual workout and that reaffirmed to me my um, passion for kind of just helping people and bringing joy to people. It was really, uh, some of the kids were super inspiring and in, in how much they, how hard they worked or how great their outlook on, on life and, um, and just general happiness was. And so, so using that, I kind of um, reaffirmed my, my place in healthcare and um, promoting health. And so yeah, that was another really good experience that I had kind of throughout university. Um, and then in third year, I was also on the part of the society again, but as a VP social, which meant I was planning um, with semi-formal and clothing events. And again, this is just more responsibility, um, but a little bit bigger on a broader scale instead of just focusing on second year, so it was the entire program. Um, and other extracurriculars included, um, I was on the dance team again in third year. Um, and then I also kind of helped out with um, cleaning dances in fourth year. I wasn't on the team, but I kind of came back to, to help clean dances, which is a, another kind of aspect of dance that I really enjoyed was the little nitpicky stuff to making something look really nice. Um, and 
outside of that, uh, outside of university in itself, I was also part, I also still am part of the uh, Canadian military, um, and that's more of a, it's a job, but also kind of an extracurricular in the sense that um, it's outside of school and it's something that I've chose to do. And that was his own experience in itself. Um, I joined um, back in 2016, and I'm a reservist, so that means I work as a part-time a military member. Um, so once a week or every other week of training, and then in the summers we do more training. Um, and I am uh, training to be a medical assistant. So that was, the reason I joined was because I really wanted to practice and improve on my discipline and on my drive uh, to work through things. I wanted to be able to complete and um, accomplish like really hard tasks, which the Army is really good at providing. Um, so basic training and stuff like that, but also getting the, um, the training that you won't get anywhere else other than the military. Um, so they let us do a lot of things through training, um, and I, that was another part of kind of moving towards healthcare, um, but in a very different setting. I also had some family in the military. Um, a few of my cousins went through it. I actually have a cousin who is a, um, a MO, a medical officer, so he's a doctor in the military. Um, I kind of saw him go through it and many other of my family members. Um, so that hearing their experience and understanding what they went through um, and how it improved their you know, qualities or just gave them an experience to, to have in life, to learn from, um, also motivated me. Um, and a part of it is also kind of the need to, or, or drive to serve, um, in the sense of, it's a very admirable thing to be part of the army. I'm not, for, for people who actually go and deploy and they actually defend the country or they help other countries that are in need. Um, I really have a, a, a want to do that as well. Um, people, like people who are going through disaster or who are you know, in the worst of times, um, for us as Canada to go and help them, I think that's something that also kind of pulled me and, and, and attracted me towards the, the, the military because um, there's you can do a lot, you know, as a, whatever your, your position is here in, in Hamilton or in Toronto or in Canada, but having that opportunity to go somewhere where, you know, it's maybe a war-torn country and having the ability to, to be in that dangerous place and provide that care is something that I also um, have an interest in. I, I still do. I don't know if it, it'll um, happen one day, but um, it's something that I'm still considering. So I wanted that option for myself. I kind of wanted to keep my options open of what my future might look like. So um, that was also another motivation I had. The military, being a reservist is a lot easier than being a regular force member, um, which is the difference. So there's reserves and then there's the regular force. Regular force means that you're full-time in the military and reserves means that you are you were part-time. So um, during my university, it was every Wednesday night for three hours we had training, and then one weekend a month we had training. And the military is really good at prioritizing your life in, in the sense of your career and what you're working towards on the civilian side. So if you have you know, tests coming up, if you're really stressed, or if you have things that you don't, you kind of need to sacrifice the military time for, they are understanding of that, um, for, for the most part, as long as it's reasonable. And um, so they will accommodate for you. Um, but it was, it didn't really hint, take away from, from my university or my schoolwork, kind of just added more structure to it, because I knew every Wednesday night I had this training. And it also gave me just a break from, from school and put me in a very different setting that's um, a little bit more formal and, and there's different hierarchies. It got, it's just a change of pace that I kind of enjoyed. Um, so it, I don't feel like it was a, a big hindrance more than, say, um, having an actual full, like, part-time job. Because I also had part-time jobs during, uh, while I was in the military. And those kind of took a little bit more time away because that was a little bit more hours in the week. But, um, yeah, if, if you couldn't make it up to a weekend because you had an exam coming up, they were understanding of that. And how do you go about joining uh, the reserves? The process is um, you go to the offices and um, express your interests, and it's kind of a logging process of where they have to do a full medical um, checkup on you to make sure that you know you don't have um, anything that will hinder your capability of serving the military. 
um, and then they do a full background check. Um, you have to write an aptitude test um, to see where you kind of rank. Um, that can determine which specialty you're allowed to go into. Um, and then you also have a physical test which kind of makes sure that you meet the standard of physical fitness to be in the military. Um, and then there's an interview that you have with one of the military members who kind of, again, asks you your questions, your motivations, and seeing where you fit best. Um, the whole process for me took about um, eight-ish months to, to get through because there's a lot of paperwork that needs to be, be done, references that need to be contacted, um, and so it's a long process. But... Um, yeah, and then in the end, you uh, are sworn in by the unit that you're a part of, um, and and you can begin training. Like, how did you end up at PA? Was did you know that from the get go, or were there other careers that were considering? I kind of went through a, a long journey to get to where I am today. Um, in high school, actually, maybe grade ten, grade ten, I think, I was looking towards business. Actually, I was. The way that I was deciding on what I wanted to do with my life was what I could see myself as. And for some reason, I could see myself as a businessman. So that was my initial interest for some reason. And then um, I don't remember the exact moment or what caused it. There was a shift in my thinking, and I started gravitating towards sciences. I think um, that stemmed kind of from the wanting to help people aspect. And I know a lot of people want to help people, but I think... Um, I sort of had this thought or idea of wanting to be that person who can drastically help someone in medical need. So um, sometimes you know, in a hospital, people come to you at their worst, um, they're broken, they're tired, or there's something wrong, and it, they need help. And I kind of saw myself fitting into that role and being able to handle that responsibility. Um, I think it takes a certain person, um, the right amount of empathy, but also the right amount of um, being able to handle the emotional toll that it can have to have someone in their worst of times relying on you. And I think I thought that I had that. So using that, I kind of thought that I want to do that so my kind of end goal became um, being in healthcare. Um, naturally, as most people do, the first thought was medicine or becoming a physician. So from there, um, I took the sciences, I took all the sciences that I needed and applied to sciences and kinesiology um, at McMaster and U of T. And then my journey began of kind of, okay, I'm going to med school, what do I have to do to to get, that ha to get that to happen. So I started taking all of the required, not the required, but the recommended courses like chemistries and bios. And it was kind of just on this one track of mind if I'm gonna go to medicine and was chugging along um, first year, second year, you know, ups and downs of grades and kind of um, motivations. But it was still, you know, at the end of the day, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it there because I have to. Um, so I kept going and I got to third year, was still headed towards it. I wrote the MCAT after third year, and it didn't go the greatest. Um, and third year, my marks weren't also the greatest in third year, so that was kind of demotivating, but I still was pretty headstrong on trying again and making fourth year better and rewriting the MCAT. So, um, so I still applied just to get the, the process of applying and getting used to the um, what it takes to apply to med schools, um, but I didn't expect to get in because of my MCAT score. Um, but I applied, and in the meantime, I knew that I wasn't going to be doing anything next year because um, I wasn't going to get into any med schools. So I started looking into other programs and stuff, programs that were short in duration, so in case I did get in, that I could move on to med school after. Um, and so I looked into master, one-year master's programs at McMaster and other schools. And then I actually fell upon the PA program. And my friend mentioned it to me, and she said that they, the application is, you don't need references or anything, you just have to put in your, your transcript. And at the time, I was like, okay, yeah, that doesn't sound like it requires too much, and I've heard of a physician assistant before, so I'll just apply. So I applied, and then you get the, the email back with the supplementary application information, 
So I thought, okay, if, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it properly. So I started looking into the program and looking into the profession a lot more. And that's kind of where my physician assistant journey began. But to backtrack a little bit, um, after second year, I shadowed a doctor um, in an emergency department just to get uh, just to get a kind of a view of what a doctor does there. And while I was there, I also saw a physician assistant, and I followed her around for a bit. And she showed me that she, she did some stitches on some people. She was just talking about the profession, but I didn't um, fully grasp it at the time, but I kind of thought back to it, and I remembered seeing her. I remembered how cool her position was, and I could easily see myself doing that as well. Um, so as I was doing my research, I kind of started progressing on this kind of journey of thinking, okay, you know what, maybe this is a possibility for me. Maybe this is, maybe I should just kind of pursue this. And I kind of made it a mission to, to either prove myself wrong or prove myself right, to either convince myself that I, I'm going to do med school or I'm going to do, um, do become a PA. So I started talking to everyone that I knew who was involved in the program, who, who is a PA, who, who got in and accepted, who, were, who got in and rejected the offer. Um, I was watching multiple YouTube videos, and eventually I um, got the MMI, and so I dived even deeper into it, and then I did the MMI, and then I got in, and that kind of rotated my entire world around because now it became real. And so I talked to more people, and I got to know more things about the, uh, the, the program and the position, and... I was self-reflecting a lot, and I think that's what kind of, and what really was the turning point in the journey, the, the self-reflection, because I looked back to, at my initial motivation of why I wanted to do medicine, why I wanted to go into healthcare, and it was to, to help people who were in need of help, medical help, and I automatically went to physician because that's what everyone goes to, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only way to do it. Um, many people help people in need that are in the medical field, you know, like nurses and physiotherapists and respiratory therapists and physician assistants. And physician assistant is, they help them in many ways. They, they are doing um, a physician's job in a sense, and they are helping and they're treating and, and managing patients. So um, why, why not? Why, what's, what's the takeaway from this? Um, so I actually was in a, in, a, in a course in my second semester that um, we had to do weekly reflections in. And in the course was a work, self, and purpose course where you like dive into your personality and what type of person you are and what career might be best for you. And um, through those self-reflections, I could see my transition from saying, oh, maybe this might be like the right thing to me to like, I think this is actually the right thing for me. Like, I think PA is what I'm supposed to do. Um, and it's still a journey and it's still a process of, of assuming this role and becoming this person. Um, and I'm going through it still, you know, up to today. And over time, I kind of fell in love with the profession. I fell in love with the advocacy. And I had a lot of reasons over time because I was learning so much about it. And so I guess to kind of sum it up, the other reasons that I chose PA is because I wanted to help people who were in medical need of help. And that lets me, this profession lets me do that. I am a fan of the two years instead of the seven plus years. It's sounds good to me. Um, I made a five-year plan of three different five-year plans. One five-year plan was med school, one was PA, and one was becoming a dancer um, that traveled across the world. But in those five-year plans with med school, after the five years, I was in residency still. With the PA one, in five years, I had like a new car and a dog, and it just looked like a nice life, um, and a life that I kind of wanted to live. And I was working. So it, I, I enjoy, I value that. Um, I value working more than I value researching things on, on a computer. Um, and also the, the lateral mobility was obviously a, a big selling factor. I feel like I'm, I try to be a versi versatile, versatile person, um, bring versatility into my life. And I think having that option of being able to move to a different specialty, um, was you know, pivotal in, in my decision as well because with being a physician, you have to redo an entire residency if you want to switch into a different position, um, into a different specialty. So I think having that as well was um, kind of a cherry on top 
of everything else um, to, to realize that this is probably the best profession for me to be in. And in the end, also the, the work-life balance of, of being a physician assistant, um, depending on your specialty, of course, but I think that also I have a lot of different values in my life, things that I want to see, um, traveling and family time and dance, things I want to still make time for. I don't want my life to become my job. So all of that, all of those things kind of fit really well into the physician assistant program and into the job itself. What advice would you have for students that are struggling between the PA versus MD route? Yeah, I think um, self-reflection and um, honesty, being honest with yourself. Um, because it's really easy to trick yourself or to convince yourself of one thing, um, even though you don't actually fully believe in it. I think that's a really tough thing to do. It took me really a, a long time to get, to get to, but it took talking to people, talking to people who have gone through it or people who are important to you or people who um, have experiences similar to this who can kind of give you their perspective because sometimes you can become, you can get tunnel vision and you just focus on one thing and you don't consider other perspectives or other options. So expanding your horizons in that sense is definitely something I would recommend. Um, also just researching and watching tons of YouTube videos of people explaining their experience um, like this video or other videos on this channel <laughs> but um, and just hearing what people what their experience is and asking the questions that you need to ask but also just you know maybe write a journal every week of, of what your thought process is, what is important to you, where, where are your actual values? Do you need the title of MD or do you just want an avenue to help people? Um, do you need to be the, the leader in a group? Another thing to consider when you're uh, trying to pick a career is are you picking it for the title? Are you picking it for the status, the prestige? Or are you picking it because of what it allows you to do? So being a physician allows you to provide health care to patients. Being a physician assistant also allows you to provide health care to patients. Being a nurse also allows you to do the same thing. So there's obviously different degrees of, of health care that you're providing, but at the end of, end of the day, if your reason to become a physician is to help people, then that's a reason to become a lot of things. So I think you know, being honest with yourself, like, are you okay with being not called you know, a physician, a doctor, having doctor in front of your name or MD, having you know, a different title but still providing a really important role in healthcare? Um, and I think that's a hard pill to swallow for some people. I think for some people they haven't really considered it, um, but it is something to think about. Another thing is obviously your role in the healthcare team. So a physician has a different role than a physician assistant. The physician is the supervising um, member in the sense that if um, something goes wrong, then you know people usually look to the physician, um, and you know you, you will consult your physician on a lot of things. So if you're if you have something within you that you need to be the leader in every circumstance, not in every but to be the leader generally or to be the kind of um, last line of defense slight kind of thing, then, then you have to be also honest with yourself. If you're not okay with having limited or some type of, yeah, like kind of scope that's limited um, like a physician assistant does and under like you know, medical directives, if you're not okay with that, then you have to be honest with yourself there too. If you're not okay with, you know, you're not going to be the one doing the intensive surgery. You're not going to be the one, you know, inside doing all of those things. You might be assisting in that, or you might be just taking care of the inpatients and the outpatients. You have to consider all of those things because um, it is a different role and it has different responsibilities, different tasks that are completed. So, you know, writing down what is actually important to you, reflecting on that, and then talking to people who will inquire and, and kind of throw questions at you to, to kind of open up different ideas or perspectives is important um, to kind of get a concrete motivation to become whatever you want to become. What was your GPA? Yeah, so this is a good question, and it's interesting because um, in undergrad, I rarely ever shared my GPA, 
And I think that kind of speaks to the differences between undergrad and, and, um, and graduate professional school. Because in undergrad, there's this kind of unspoken competition between people. And when you told someone your GPA, it could you know, change their perspective on you. They might look for you to, to, help, to get some extra help. Or um, you know, if they're competing against you, then it kind of it just was an uncomfortable experience at times. But I think you know, definitely in, in graduate or in PA school, um, that isn't there. No one even asks you what you got on a test. It's kind of, are you happy with what you got? Which is, I kind of really like, because I think that's what's important. Um, but so my GPA, um, my cumulative GPA of all four years of kinesiology was a 3.64. And um, I was, personally, I was aiming for a higher GPA. I, I would have liked a higher GPA, but in the end of the day, I think it's reflective of kind of who I am in terms of I know why I got that GPA. So in first year, first year was my worst year, as most people have that experience. And that's just because I was getting used to it and kind of I was more excited by the university experience than I was about grades, which is natural, I hope. Um, and so that was my worst year. The second year, everything flipped, and it was my best year academically, um, which was surprising, but it, I was really happy with it. But I was basically just head down, nose, face, in books all the time. And it, it worked out academically, but I was, felt like I was missing something. I kind of was, my excitement level or my like content or happiness was kind of just stagnant. It, was, it wasn't really much happening in my life. I was just kind of focusing a lot. And I've kind of realized that I need a balance. Even though I got great marks, I still need that balance in my life where I kind of go crazy. So... In third year, I got super involved and kind of went a little bit too far past the spectrum and kind of spread myself thin on a lot of different responsibilities and roles, um, and that ended up bringing my GPA back down. Um, and I kind of, again, it was another learning experience to learn kind of who I am and what I can handle. And, you know, having a lot of roles and responsibilities is good, but if you can't do them all effectively, then it's not worth it. It's better to do you know, two things, do them really well, than do five things and do them all below average. So I realized that. And so in fourth year, I kind of cut back a little and found an, a happy balance between everything. And it was also very, an existential year of trying to figure out who I am uh, as a human. And so my kind of trajectory of, P, of GPA kind of went from like, low in first year to high in second year and then a little bit lower here in third and then fourth year is like about here. So that all kind of 3.64. Yes. And were your study methods more uh, rote memorization or did you have a certain way to help you improve your grades? Yeah, that's another thing that kind of you have to go through to, to learn about yourself. Um, but also learn that every class kind of requires a different study method or study technique. So in first year we had anatomies and we had physiologies and that requires a little bit more road memorization, knowing just what bone is this is, what bone is this, you know, what are the stages of embryology or um, you know, fetus formation, like just memorizing those and then spitting them back out on a multiple choice exam. Um, th that is a lot of just being able to recognize material and then and circling it. So in first year, it was a lot of memorization um, because everything was multiple choice. And then as you progress through the years, at least in kinesiology and probably in other programs, the classes get smaller and the tests get a little bit more short answer based. So that requires a different type of studying because it requires a different type of understanding. It's not um, recognition anymore, now it's recall. So with the recall, you have to be able to also remember the information but also communicate the information on paper and I think that requires more just understanding the material but also practicing the material. And I think that's probably one of the best pieces of advice that I could give for, for studying is practicing. I think you can read a textbook 10 times versus reading it twice and then trying to explain it to your friend or, or write it down on a piece of paper like on a blank piece of paper. I think that's more effective because it activates, it, it kind of sees if you have those you know, neural connections, if you've made those memories or not. And if you haven't, you'll work hard to try to remember it, and that's just strengthening your memory. So 
again, like advice for, you know, getting a, a good GPA or trying to like to move ahead, it's very subjective. Everyone has different weaknesses. Everyone has different strengths. Um, some people have a great memory and can easily memorize, you know, 10 terms. And some people need to look at it a hundred times to remember it. So it, it depends on you. You have to look, you have to experiment with what works. But I think um, practicing is never a bad idea. Um, you know, a couple days, uh, two days before the test, just take an empty piece of paper and then write everything that you know about one topic and see what you're missing, see what you got wrong, and then refine it from there. Um, yeah, I use that for certain courses that required short answer questions, and I saw a drastic improvement in my mark. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you went from one extreme to another when it comes to time, time management, mm -hmm. like extracurriculars versus um, hardcore studying. Yes. So what is the balance for you now? Like what would a typical day or week of studying look like for you? The balance is something that I think we will forever work on. I don't think anyone finds it perfect and like maintains it because even when you find the balance, you still have to work to maintain the balance. Um, but for me, I am mostly studying um, a lot, but I think I've taken on some responsibilities and I've structured my week in a way where if I have time that's scheduled to not study. Um, so what that means is if I you know, have a friend that I haven't seen in a while, I'll schedule a time in to go hang out with them for a few hours. And once that's you know, in my schedule, then I can structure my studying around that. So I know that I'm going to be spending you know, half a day here or a couple hours here doing something. Um, I know that I have to accommodate for that, so I have to study a little bit more on this day and uh, make sure I get a little bit ahead so I don't fall behind. And I think planning ahead is... is the best idea also in, um, in undergrad or in, in PA school. And so my week, like if I have tutorial on Monday, um, say it's an evening tutorial, I'll go um, wake up, do some work for the, the tutorial and then go to the gym maybe and then go back, have you know lunch, finish tutorial prep and then go to tutorial. So you know, it's, it's that one day, there's a lot of tutorial prep happening, a lot of studying happening, but that's also um, within there, there might be some email replies that I have to do, or may I, maybe I have to work on my, um, uh, on the SOAP note that I, that's due the next day. So it kind of depends on the week, depends on um, what's happening and how many other responsibilities I have put into my to-do list um, that week. So it's dependent on a lot of things, but um, there's a lot of studying happening, for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, Mac is known for problem-based learning, and I know that the PA program uses a lot of that. So what is PBL? So, yeah, so PBL is problem-based learning. And to be honest, it, it's used um, a lot within McMaster completely. So nursing also has it, and um, the health science program has it. Phys uh, physiotherapist students do it, speech language uh, pathologists also perform, uh, use PBL. And so what PBL is, is that you, you take a problem and then you learn from it. So problem-based learning, which is straightforward. But um, what that looks like in the PA program is that on tutor at tutorial, you're given a, a case. In this case, it tells you that, you know, Mr. So-and-so has um, it comes presents to the clinic with these signs and symptoms. This is his past medical history. These are the medications that he's on, and you know this is what he's been feeling. Um, and he, when you do a physical exam, you see this, this, and this. And so now you have this problem of of the patient and what their problem is, and you use that problem to okay. So what what do we think it is, and what do we need to learn about? So say he has um, asthma. Is he's having an asthma attack. Okay, so what do you want to learn about asthma? You use this problem to now make objectives to learn about. So, uh, yeah, what is, what is asthma? What, let's learn about lung anatomy and the drive to breathe. Let's learn about the medications that people for asthma take. Let's learn about the, um, the investigations that you can perform to, see, to, to test if someone has asthma. So you're using this one problem to kind of base your learning off of. So, um, and then when you come together, it's not a lecture style, it's, um, tutorial is a, you know, s 
seven to eight people uh, in, a, in a room with a tutor who kind of um, stays quiet usually, usually, but they will guide you along when you are straying from the path. And you all come together after doing your research and you just discuss what you've learned. And you discuss all of those things that I just mentioned and uh, seeing where, um, if you have differences in research, if you guys found something different or if... Um, there's something that someone doesn't understand, someone un understands more, then you can explain that to them, and you're kind of just using this group-based um, setting to, to learn about the problem and to be able to solve the problem. So you're, when you have a problem, you're trying to find the solutions, and learning the solutions is, is the main part. Um, yeah, so the problem gives you a solution. What are some of your favorite resources uh, to go to when you're tackling PBL cases? So the program provides uh, us a couple textbooks, or the, the second year has also provided us a, a, a drive of textbooks, um, and we use those. So for anatomy and physiology, um, there's an anatomy and physiology textbook that you can kind of get your base knowledge from. And then there is um, a textbook called Toronto Notes, which provides you kind of with the Canadian um, perspective or Canadian guidelines on, on a long list of different uh, diseases and complications um, and it kind of condenses it really well so that's a really good thing to take a glance at at the beginning to kind of get a like really condensed picture of what um, the approach to a certain disease is and then from there I've kind of gone on this journey of using different resources to see what I like um, but right now I, I like using um, up to date because I've heard that it's used pretty frequently in clinic and hospitals use it a lot, so I thought I should get used to it and I, I have gotten somewhat used to it. it. There's a lot of information. If you go to the, the summary tab, it condenses it pretty well. Um, I also like to use uh, AMBOSS, which provides also really good summaries and condenses information to the most important stuff. They provide uh, links to videos, which is definitely appreciated. Um, and then speaking of videos, I definitely like watching, you know, a, um, a video from Khan Academy or any, any kind of company that does, uh, organization that does YouTube videos on diseases. Um, and I watch a variety of those to get a kind of a better picture because being, sometimes being taught stuff is definitely helpful and those videos are usually 10 minutes long so you can rewatch it a few times um, and add that to your notes. So I think using a variety of resources and kind of finding what works for you, what kind of your palate can, can take, um, is, is the best idea. I know a lot of people use a lot of different resources, but um, there's some that are more popular than others. Like Amboss is definitely popular and up to date, and um, watching Khan Academy videos or Osmosis videos are, are definitely uh, popular. Mm -hmm. And can you just quickly like, go through a list of different classes that you um, take in first year MAC and what those classes are? Mm -hmm. On um, Monday, okay, well, I'll just go through the classes. So we have tutorial, and tutorial is where we learn our content. Um, and we, yeah, again, are in this group of eight people with a tutor, and that's where we learn, you know, the disease, the, the epidemiology of it, the, the pathophys of it, what investigations you order, and the treatment, signs and symptoms, stuff like that. And then we have uh, our IER class. IER, so interviewing, examining, and reasoning. And that is basically our clinical skills class where we learn how to take a history, how to take vitals, how to do a physical exam, listening to the heart, lungs, abdominal exam, lymph node exam, stuff like that. Um, and then on Wednesdays, which is our kind of flex day, we have communications class, which happens once a month. And that's basically how when we learn and practice talking to difficult patients or patients that are going through difficult scenarios that are a little bit more touchy. And this class is more just about communicating. You don't only really have to bring knowledge or content. It's kind of just being empathetic and um, relating to a patient. So, for example, a patient who just found out that they have cancer. How, how do you approach that and how do you talk to them? Um, and then on some Wednesdays we have ProComp, which is our professional competencies class. And that's when we have usually a um, subject matter expert come in and explain a topic to us. And those topics can, can, can include um, health policies and the uh, Canadian government and how that 
and incorporates health into it, um, learning about the history of the PA role, um, PA advocacy, how um, social media affects the profession and affects healthcare, um, and learning about the uh, interactions between PAs and NPs and what um, people are saying about PAs and their perspectives on them. So we are more rounded um, PAs and clinicians when we're working. And then we also have LGSs, which are large group sessions. And these include learning about ECGs or spirometry, uh, other investigations, or specifically maybe sometimes we have uh, when it's about a disease. So we've had congestive heart failure, LGSs. We've had um, maternal complications uh, during pregnancy, LGSs. And uh, yeah, and then, then we have so tutorial twice a week and everything else is once a week, once every other week. Um, and then sometimes we have staff meetings where the class meets with the staff to talk to them. Um, that happens like maybe once every two months where we just talk about what's coming up, if we're talking about clerkship, if we're talking about CRE or stuff like that. Okay, and how much of this is didactic where you're being kind of spoon-fed information in a very traditional way? The LGSs and the ProCom sessions are somewhat didactic. Um, LG LGSs are definitely di didactic. ProComp is, they definitely motivate or they encourage group participation. So there is a, a, a teacher or a um, lecturer at the front who is giving us a lecture with PowerPoint slides, but a lot of the time we will break up into groups and talk about a topic, and that happens throughout the entire class. It happens almost every class. So uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's PBL, but it is a little bit more interactive. It's not you're just sitting there taking notes. They don't really encourage taking notes during ProCop. It's more of a listening and understanding and talking to your peers about it, talking to the, to the um, to the facilitator, um, but that's that's kind of the the majority of our didactic portion during LGS and ProComp. Um, other than that, IER or the clinical skills class is a lot about. It's somewhat didactic in the sense that the preceptor and the preceptors are usually either working PAs um, that have been working for a different amount of time, or a doctor or a retired doctor, someone who's who knows the clinical material well. Um, they'll explain it to us, explain what the exam looks like and what's expected, and but then it's a lot of practice. That's what the class is for, mostly practice. Um, and then communications is more just practicing as well. Okay, and you also um, have uh, longitudinal placements or LPs. So what is that and um, what do you enjoy about it? Yeah, so the LPs, longitudinal placements, are placements that the students organize um, and they are basically four half days. So that's, say, four hours of a placement, four times would be one longitudinal placement. So like a total of 16 hours. And they can be in any specialty um, with any PA or doctor. And we organize them, we find the contacts, and then we put them together and schedule a time. So I really enjoy these because it, can let, it allows you to kind of explore anything that you're interested in. So uh, if you are really interested in um, uh, geriatrics and you can do a LP in geriatrics, or if you're really interested in general surgery and being in surgery and like talking to surgeons and seeing what their life is like, then you can go there and, and, and do an LP there. Um, I've personally done a LP in family medicine, in the cardiac ICU, and in emergency hospital. And all three were, were great. I had amazing preceptors for all three, um, and they were all with PAs. Um, and they've been all been working for a while. And I really enjoyed the time that I spent with them more than anything, I think. Like, they all understand where I am in the PA program. They've all, I think, have a lot of experience with students. So they were really good at teaching me things and allowing me to do things and giving me kind of um, a window into their life. But they also took time to just talk to me about what they go through day to day and things that they think about, things that they kind of encounter and their perspective on the profession, on the future of the profession. We had really good conversations in, in the time that I was with them. And I really enjoyed that aspect of just kind of they kind of became my role models in, in a sense of like 
one day I want to be like them in, in advocating for the profession, but also just being a great PA. Like they were all just very respected and nurses or physicians all just let them do what they needed to do because they trusted them and they um, had a really good bond together. And I think that's one like a really big goal of mine or a big goal of everyone should be just to, to integrate well into the healthcare team. And just by doing that, you're advocating for PAs because um, if your physician likes you, if your healthcare team likes you, then they'll say good things. Mm -hmm. And um, what's involved in second year of PA school and what are you looking forward to? Second year of PA school is our clerkship year, which means that we rotate through different um, specialties and there's varying lengths of specialties. So, um, in, so there's different streams that you can go into, but for an example, a stream could be that you do three months of family medicine at the beginning. And it's always three months for family med um, and you do that in, in one clinic. And then you can do, after that, let's say you do emergency for a month and then general surgery for a month and then internal medicine for a month, and then um, an elective for a month. An elective can be in any specialty that you have an interest in. And then you could have, the other ones are um, psych, um, pediatrics, and there's two weeks of geriatrics, another elective, and I think that's all of them, internal medicine, I don't know if I already said that. Um, so yeah, you have those. And it's basically your time to get a, a taste of working in that specialty. So you are a PA student still, but you are um, expected to see patients, you're expected to, to talk to patients, to kind of make differential diagnoses and work with a physician as a physician assistant would um, to get the experience of what it's actually like to be one. And so in that four months or however long you hope to gain that experience, gain that um, knowledge, kind of dip your toe into what it might look like to work in that specialty and hopefully we find out where we think we uh, will work best. Um, I'm excited for all of it, to be honest. I, I came in to the PA program very um, drawn towards emergency medicine and working in the emergency department, but now after doing a few different placements in different places, I realized that I could find, you know, passion or love in almost any specialty because you see so many different types of patients and every specialty kind of have kind of has a uh, different vibe or a different atmosphere when you walk into it so a family medicine clinic will obviously feel different when you walk in versus an emergency department or an ICU um, the patients are very drastically different in those three settings but so in all, all of those three settings I still was happy to see patients I still um, enjoyed being there so I'm excited for just learning everything and not learning everything but seeing all of the different specialties um, but I'm also excited for I have to say emergency like I also wanted to, I wanted to do maybe in a, a rural placement to see a what a rural hospital looks like and how they function um, as an elective and um, the PE program at McMaster also allows us to do international electives if we want. So I know some students uh, in the past that are working now have done international electives, and I think I still want to keep that option open for myself because I think that would be a really good experience in seeing how healthcare is handled um, in a different area and in, in a developing country, um, and to kind of experience that and hopefully use that experience to, to become a better PA here or maybe even one day be working in a different country um, that's not Canada. So, um, yeah, I'm excited for the entire 12 months after <laughs> September. And um, do you know where you're going to do your electives in, apart from a rural emergency, or is that still up in the air? Um, so, yeah, we have two electives. I think rural emergency, I um, actually have been talking to um, a physician that I know. He's um, I, I know him from, he's a family, he's, he's in the family, but I'm asking him if he has any physicians that would be willing to take me on, because you obviously can't be a precept, like your preceptor can't be your family, but um, so that would be in uh, the Barry area, um, I think in Alliston, and the elder elective right now I'm thinking um, an international elective, so there's a lot of different organizations that can uh, put together, in a, well, they can provide you with options for an international elective. There's um, PAs for Global Health, which is an, a website that kind of just links you to a lot of different universities in the U.S. 
um, and colleges, uh, physician assistant schools, sorry, that are doing international electives, and you can, they give you their contact information, so you can potentially set up something where you can join their students and do an international elective. That's something that I'm interested in, but I also, it's hard to, um, to justify or to kind of decide on what's best because some people say you know it's best to get more experience here where you're actually going to be working and building more connections and networking and maybe finding a potential employer or making better references here um, or in a hospital that you might be working at one day so but there, there's also the side of if you go internationally getting that experience can um, improve your character for one and but also improve your um, uh, provide provision of healthcare or also your perspective on healthcare and that can you know overall make you a better PA a better clinician so it's it's hard to, to kind of decide which one's best for me I still have a little bit more time to decide um, but I don't know I think hopefully during clerkship I'll be able to um, it'll give me insight into what I think is best maybe you know the um, 11 months of, of being you know in Ontario will be enough for me to to get enough connections or to get enough experience in, in the Ontario healthcare system. And then a month abroad would be great to kind of round me out as a, a person, but also a clinician that's seen the other side of, of healthcare somewhere else. And um, just to sort of wrap up our discussion about PA school, what, uh, what do you enjoy about going to McMaster's PA program? Yeah, uh, I really enjoy the people. Um, I'm lucky enough to be with a lot of great people. I've become really good friends with these, with, with the students that I'm with. Um, we've bonded over a lot of, you know, hardships and stress, but also we've gone out and, and hung out at people's houses and it's just kind of, we all know what we're going through. No one knows what you're going through like a PA student when you're also a PA student. So um, that's one of my really favorite parts of, of Mac, especially because Compared to uh, U of T, it's distance learning. So you don't really see your classmates that often. You see them in the residential blocks, which happen you know, once in a while. Um, so I really value that face-to-face -face contact. So I see my tutorial group twice a week for three hours each, so six hours with my tutorial group. I see my clinical skills group, which is a different group, um, three hours a week, and then I see communications once a week, then we have pro comps where I see everybody. So we see each other pretty often compared to other pro, uh, to, compared to U of T. Um, but even compared to undergrad, you, you see them often. So you, and you get to know them really well. And I think I value that. I also really, really value the preceptors and the t tutors that we've had. They've all been just really great. And I think I've been especially lucky because I keep getting paired or put into groups with people that I think that are just amazing. Um, they advocate for practical and clinical content. They advocate for our um, learning and they want us to be prepared for next year and clerkship and prepared for the real world. They're not just doing this just because it's something to do. They're really invested in us and I really appreciate that and I think I will be that much of a better PA because I've had experiences with those tutors and preceptors. Um, and I think, yeah, th those two things are definitely huge parts of it. And also McMaster is just also kind of my home. I did my four years there. I'm from Hamilton. So um, it's really easy for me. I, don't, I didn't have to adjust to a new school in any way. I, I have my set places that I like to study, places that I like to get food. I know where the dance studio is. It kind of all just... I didn't have to change much of my life um, when I came to the program. So, um, yeah, it, it was probably the best decision I could have made. Um, I also didn't really have, I don't apply to the other schools, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, based on your experience so far, uh, what attributes or characteristics do you think would make a great PA student? Like, who is someone who would excel in the master's PA program? There's a lot of different things that I've noticed in different people and in myself that I think have helped and things that haven't. So I think being able to not have, being okay with out structure. So 
in undergrad, you have your lectures, and they tell you what you need to know. This is what you need to know. Go home and study it. In PA school, it's not like that. It's more, this, this is the topic you need to know about. Go and learn about the topic. I'm not giving you the content. I'm giving you the topic. Go learn about it. And you have to be okay with that. Um, and it's definitely a transition of putting all of your learning into your own hands, um, not having lectures to rely on, just your own, own notes completely. Um, that, that kind of takes a, a certain type of person to kind of accept that responsibility and accept that stress. So, so I think stress is also another thing. If Obviously, if you handle stress in any situation, you'll do better if you handle it well. So I think, um, especially in the PA program, when you have the stress of you know, knowing the content, but knowing it enough that you can use it because we're not learning this content for just to do well on a test. We're learning it to help people one day. So that, that stress is also from doing well on tests, but also like, do I know this when I'm in clinic? Like when a, when a physician asks me, so what do you do for the patient? Like, do I know it? Because there's a real person in that room and um, what you know can change their outcome. So there's that stress and there's also the stress of um, being an advocate for a PA because a lot of people don't know what a PA is and you have to explain that a lot of times. Your elevator speech becomes pristine after like a couple months of being a PA and um, you have to be okay with advocating for something that people don't know about, people question, people um, sometimes underappreciate or they, they just don't know enough because it's not talked about so you have to be okay with being that a voice, um, and sometimes that can be stressful, but sometimes you know it becomes a joy. Or you will, I, I enjoy advocating for it, but I do feel you know when there's seven people around me and they all don't know what a PA is, and I have to explain it to all of them, and it's a, the fourth time I've done it, it, it can kind of take a, a little bit of a toll. Other than that, um, I think versatility is definitely something that helps being able to jump from one specialty to it to another really quickly because we spend about a month and a half to a month to maybe two months on on each unit so you're doing you know cardiology for a month and a half and you're switching right to respiratory and then you're the other way around but or then you're going to hematology and you're kind of very going through content very quickly and you have to be okay with that that you're not spending like a whole week on one disease. You're spending like a few days on it and you're moving on. And then at the end, you're kind of amalgamating everything into this clinical picture or clinical understanding. So um, being able to critically think and use problem solving is definitely a good skill to have because the tests aren't just multiple choice recognition just like memorization it's like here's another problem solve the problem so you have to be able to think outside the box you have to be able to apply the content you've learned to a very novel situation um, novel patient so having that skill is or having practiced that skill at all in your undergrad is definitely helpful um, and yeah I think also being naturally good at communicating is, I think, huge. Um, obviously, you can work on it, but there, there's a certain factor that kind of you just, some people have and some people don't. And I don't want to like, discourage anyone, but I think you can work on it. But like what I've noticed is that everyone in the program that I've seen just has a certain way about them, a certain presentation when they talk to patients, and they just know how to talk to them. They know how to show genuine empathy um, to someone who's going through something hard and they can take it seriously. Even though when they know it's not a real patient, they still feel for them because they know that like, this could be one day. So being able to do that, being able to assume that role and um, relate to someone that you've never met before, that you know is, even, is just acting because they're a standardized patient, is, is another skill. Um, so if you're not good at awkward silences, is something to work on. If you're not good at um, seeing someone cry or break down in front of you, it's something to work on. Um, but being able to, to do that, to stay professional, but also empathetic, is it's a tough balance, but it, it's um, important to the, to the program. That was a phenomenal answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm like feeling it here. So. <laughs> um, so what are some of the most common questions you get from pre-PAs? 
So a lot of the common questions, especially, especially around this time and maybe a few months before, was about the application process. So I'll let maybe just answer questions about that. What does it include, the application process? So at the beginning, you send in your transcript, and that's it. So you don't send in a reference. You don't send in a CV. You, there is, it asks you like what some of the things you've done after undergrad, but um, I also applied. I was within um, university students, so maybe my application was a little bit different, but that's what I remember. And then you send that in, and then if you make the GPA cutoff, which is a 3.0, then you're um, provided the email with the sub app, if, I think. Um, and then the supplementary application is a uh, video slash written interview that you do um, online at home. And it's two video questions and two written questions. You watch a video of someone asking a question, and then you record a, a video of yourself answering that question within a time limit. And there's two of those, and there's two written questions. You read a question, and then you write your answer, you type your answer uh, within the time limit. And so that's what the SUP app is. So I get a lot of questions of advice for the SUP elementary application. And my advice is practice, which was my advice from before. Practicing is really good. But before you practice, you have to know, obviously, what the supplementary application will be like, and also just general theories and ideas of answering supplementary application or interview style, MMI style questions, um, or CASPER, which is something that people write for med school and nursing, um, which is kind of just situational and just just questions that you can expect in an interview. Um, and and learning about those, learning about the different perspectives, the different approaches that people take. Obviously, the, the four different um, uh, important, uh, I forget what they're called, but the, they're the pillars of kind of healthcare, of the, the autonomy, the beneficence, the non-maleficence, and, and justice, and, and understanding what those four are. Um, and, but also, outside of that, when you're getting into the practice, just practice talking, just practice speaking out loud to a camera because that's a very unnatural thing even though I'm doing it right now um, but it's something you have to get used to something you have to get comfortable with um, and become when you're comfortable and confident you come across like you know what you're talking about and uh, like you can be in any situation and not falter because as much as the supplementary application is looking at what you say, they're looking at how you say it. So if you are really uncomfortable or if you are stammering or stuttering or saying ums or ahs or um, kind of a deer in the headlights, that's, that's not a good sign. So I think recording yourself and watching for those little, little things in your demeanor and your posture and your facial expression, I think, and then teasing those things out, te taking um and uh out of your vocabulary, which is one of the hardest things to do, um, is something to work on, uh, especially because it's a video interview and you're not talking to a human, you're literally talking to a camera, and that, it feels very different than talking to a person. So being able to do that, so practicing is huge. And the next part, if you pass the supplementary application, is the MMI, multiple mini interview. And that is basically 12 stations uh, with two rest stations, uh, well, two, two of the 12 rest stations, and so you have 10 questions, you have about two minutes to read the question, and then six minutes to, to answer. So the question's on a door, um, you read the question for two minutes, think about it, knock on the door, walk in, answer the question, and within six minutes, buzzer goes off, you get out, go to the next door, and then repeat the process. So advice for that, again, is very similar to what I just said about the supplementary application. It's again, it's communication. It's can you communicate an idea effectively? But also the MMI is a little bit more geared towards your problem solving, I would say. It's more about um, can you approach a situation and consider all perspectives and see the positive and positives and negatives of a choice that you make? So um, structuring your answer and finding a kind of a skeleton that works for multiple questions is definitely something I would recommend. And doing that requires research. So look into um, YouTube and just look at videos of people answering questions or giving advice on how to answer an MMI question because and then look at lots of them, but in the end, don't just take one and use it, make your own. So like, take all these little different tidbits, practice, see what works, 
adjust what doesn't work and what does and make your own unique skeleton or structure to an answer and bring a unique perspective to it because you're interviewing against people. You don't want to, you don't want to blend in. You want to stand out. So, um, finding that unique voice is definitely really important and that just requires practice and also being evaluated. So talk to your friend, ask them to, to find a, a list of MMI questions so you can find them easily online and then just give the, give it to your friend and then have them ask you a question, think about it and then answer the question and they'll give you feedback right on the spot right there. And people who have gone through it are definitely helpful <clears throat> to give you feedback. But, um, yeah, finding that voice, finding um, your place, finding your perspective and your approach to a question is, is definitely important. And it makes it easier on you because you already know this is how I'm going to approach this question before you walk in. And, uh, yeah, and just, I don't know, be, uh, be genuine, be a human. Don't... Don't become a really professional robot because that's not who people are. Patients don't want a robot. They want someone who cares. They want a physician. They want a physician assistant. They want a healthcare practitioner who, who's advocating for them, not advocating for this drug or this medicine. You know, So it's just come across as it's like a conversation and um, yeah, be yourself. Mm -hmm. And how did you develop such great uh, communication skills? Practice, as I said. Practice, practice, practice. And I think um, I was, my kind of trajectory of life has kind of allowed me to practice a lot. So I, from, from grade nine, I was a drama student. Um, loved drama, loved. The aspect of drama that I liked the most was improv, improvisation. Um, and that's basically, the, the teacher gives you a, a scenario, gives you who you are and where you are, and then you go. And you just start making up a scene on the spot. And it's a hard thing to do because not only are you saying things, someone with you is saying something too. So you have to react to them and it's a yes and game and you're just adding together. And that requires a certain part of your brain to come up with things to say on the spot. And it's hard, but I loved it and I enjoyed it because it's a lot of humor involved, a lot of um, thinking on your feet, which is a skill, but since I liked it, it was easy to, to continue doing, and I got better at it over time, and like, we had improv competitions, and I just, it was a great time. So that definitely helped, um, and with that, I also, having that experience, and having, speaking in front of people, and I also was part of like, plays that were put in front of the school, and I had some significant roles in the plays, and that kind of took away a little bit of the stage fright that you have of performing because performance is everywhere. It's in an interview. You are performing. You are presenting yourself. Um, and so performance in any regard improves how you will, in, how you will perform in, in other regards. So even in dance, I danced in front of people, and that, that takes a certain type of um, confidence um, to do because you are being judged um, by all of these people and in an interview you're being judged by one or like three people or something like that right so being okay with being judged and being confident in your own ability is something that I had to work on um, and you only do that by stepping out of your comfort zone and like forcing yourself to do that so I, I used to be in plays I was the valedictorian in high school and so I gave a speech at, at the um, at a grad breakfast to, to, to run for it and I enjoyed it, I had fun and then I got to be valedictorian and I also had fun doing that. Um, and then in university I even went to like, there was an improv club and I would go there once in a while and just practice my improv and, and do stuff like that. I um, also was the uh, valedictorian for, for kinesiology um, and again that's probably just because I was valedictorian in high school and People knew that, so they just put me in there. But like, I was, I'm, I'm confident in speaking in front of people, but I'm also not. There's also obviously nerves that come along with that, but I push through it and I force myself to become uncomfortable because the more I do that, the, the window of uncomfortableness will shrink. And you know, my window of being comfortable in certain situations increases. And when it's this, when it gets big enough, you'll be comfortable in almost any situation, including interviews. So um, being comfortable immediately connects to communication 
and also just talking to people. Like one of my favorite things to do in life is just talk one on one or like one on like one on one like with people who are interested or who are willing to just talk about like why super speed is the best superpower. Like just having a two hour conversation about that and seeing where it goes and just being able to like relate to someone and um, that's something that I enjoy and that I'm naturally drawn towards. So um, because I kept doing that throughout my life, I've gotten better at communicating my ideas and um, yeah, and just being self-critical too uh, at times when you need to be. So if it's for an interview, you have to be, okay, where, where do my weaknesses lie and what do I need to improve on? Any suggestions for people that are introverted like myself um, that may not be involved in drama or the arts that want to improve their communication skills? Are there other opportunities? Yeah, I think um, just even one-on-one. -on -one, like if you have a friend that you are comfortable with, talk to them and, and have a conversation that you aren't very knowledgeable about or something or, or just having, and, but like putting aside time, like we're going to have a conversation about this and just feeling a little bit uncomfortable because you don't know the topic well and just doing that. Um, also, like I said before, recording yourself and um, seeing what you look like as you think, as you talk, as you um, as you err, like seeing what that looks like from someone else's point of view is huge because you don't see yourself when you're talking. Um, so I'd use that and using your resources, watching YouTube, and also just getting advice from people who are super comfortable with talking and what they, what's worked for them. Um, uh, people who aren't comfortable with talking but have found comfort in it, what, what has worked for them. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, I think growth in any sense is found in the discomfort zone. When you are not comfortable, that's when you grow. Um, whether, yeah, you're extroverted or introverted in either sense. It, I feel like I'm slightly extroverted, but I still push myself to become uncomfortable in certain scenarios. So move out of your comfort zone in the communication sense and you'll see improvement over a long period of time, but it requires work. Another common question was um, that I got when I came into the, into the physician assistant program was, what are you going to do after the physician? Like, are you going to go to med school after? Or are you going to go to grad school after? Something like that. And um, at first, it, because I told my family and I told um, people around me that I was going for med school, um, I felt like a need to like say, like, oh, you know what, maybe I will do med school after. Just because like, I felt this kind of pressure to... Because people were like, oh, physician assistant, okay, well, what about med school? Because like, that's what people know. Um, so it was tough, but I realized that you know a physician assistant program and the physician the position itself is its own position. It is not a stepping stone into med school. It's not a stepping stone to become a physician. It's something that that should be valued and it has its own role in healthcare. Um, physician assistants help patients. But they also help physicians. Right? They're the only people who have like directly help physicians by taking off some of their workload. And they are important to the Canadian health system. And so they should have the same, or they should have a lot of value put towards them. It shouldn't be something that um, is seen as um, something to get experience done and to like, use an interview for med school. Because if you apply to the PA program and you aren't actually interested in being a PA, then you're taking away that opportunity for someone else who really wants to. And some people apply to this program many times and don't get in, and you know, it's really unfortunate for them when someone else who gets in who doesn't really want to be a PA anyways um, takes that position away from them. And maybe that cycle they would have got in if you didn't accept or if you didn't apply. Um, but again, at the end of the day, it's, you have to do what's best for you, um, and you have to find what you love. Uh, if you don't love what you're doing, we have the luxury now of like finding something that we love. That wasn't always here, I feel. Like, so she was, like, when I talked to my parents, they didn't follow what they loved, they followed what was practical, what would support the family. But now we have the privilege of following what we love, so I, I'm trying to take full advantage of that. Um, 
And I think, you know, if, if one day I don't love being a PA, then I have to reevaluate things. And I have to, to look at myself and say, like, what am I missing? And how can I fill that hole, fill that gap? And, yeah, at the end of the day, that's all it is. It's all being honest with yourself. Um, what do you want from life? Where do you see yourself in the future? And is what you're doing now helping that happen? Because yeah. um, this is one I got from a high school student. Mm -hmm. How do I convince my parents that PA is a worthwhile profession to apply to? That's a great question. Um, don't. Just apply. <laughs> because uh, that's obviously like a very rash answer. But um, personally, I went through a similar experience where um, I didn't really like it wasn't a big conversation topic of PA school and um, it kind of just med school was still like a thing that was like that's gonna happen though one day um, and so it was hard to for me to first to accept that and then also get my parents on board in the same way um, so I think there's no one conversation that you can have um, it's kind of many conversations over time and you showing your passion for it but if it's kind of if it is a shorter time frame I think explaining to them what a physician assistant is maybe showing them a, um, a video of a physician assistant or showing them statistics of what they do or actual factual information um, and you know finding out why they are against it I think like instead of kind of fishing for why they're against it just ask them you know, what what is you know stopping you from accepting this and then when they tell you then they kind of open it up for you to to kind of tackle that and say okay well if that's what you're upset with then or if that's what you don't agree with let's talk about it let's see what we can get get through but at the end of the day just apply like you don't need parental permission on the on the application um, at the end of the day, you have to live your own life, and that's something that's hard for some people. Um, as from, from a family that really cares about me and wants the best for me, I, I want to make them proud, and I want them to, to be happy where, where, for, for what I'm doing with my life. And, you know, they came from a different country to, get, to come here to give me a better opportunity, and um, I want to use that to, the full, to its full advantage, to its full use. So... It's a tough conversation, and it's a tough thing to just, no one will ever disregard their parents. Like I, I still value what my parents will say to me um, to the highest degree, but at the end of the day, you have to live your life for yourself, because um, when you're you know, 30, your parents aren't going to be like telling you what to do or living like you know, over your head. They'll be... You know, you'll be living your own life. And at that point, you have to you'll look back at your decisions and say, okay, what did I do this for? Did I do it for me? Did I do it for my parents? If you're not happy and you did it for your parents, then, you know, it, it's, it's a tough thing to, to face. So might as well do what you find your love or passion or drive for. And if you end up not liking it at the end, the only person you have to blame is yourself. And that's way better than blaming your parents because... Um, yeah, that's not, they've done a lot for, for you. They want the best for you, but at the end of the day, um, at this age when you're, you've gone through life and you've kind of explored all options, you usually will know what's best. And did your parents' acceptance and understanding of the PA profession change from before you went to PA school to after? Absolutely, yeah. They, uh, at, at the beginning, of course, because no one really knows what a physician assistant is, they kind of were... Um, they weren't like, oh, don't do that. They, they weren't not supportive, but they just kind of weren't aware of what it is. And um, because I told them I was going to go to med school, um, they're like, oh, okay, so like you're going to do that after then, which is, isn't their fault in any way. It's kind of something that we've, we, we agreed upon or we talked about over time. So, but after me like being in the program, I'm telling them, oh, this is what they can do. The other day I did this, like I put stitches in someone, like I've seen patients on my own, like I've been doing these things. They're like, oh, okay, so it's like an actual, you know, you are providing health care. You are doing a lot of the things that a doctor does. It's not a, because like 
you know, as we all know, the term assistant comes with a certain um, stereotype or a certain um, perspective on, on what assistant means. So especially when people don't know what physician assistant is at all, the, the word assistant just kind of stands out over the physician apart. So um, with that, like over time, kind of instead of seeing it as, as just the words, seeing it as the actual profession is a process and you can't blame anyone for, for going through that process. So they, they definitely over time have now, they fully support everything and you know, I owe everything to them still. Um, but yeah, they, they're happy, they are happy for me and motivate me and uh, um, are, are proud of me and I, and I feel that from them. So um, it's, it's really good to have that support and I think it's because they're understanding people and it's, it was my kind of communication to them over time that kind of changed their perspective on the position as it did mine because I didn't know what it was at the beginning either. So. Um, it's a process for everyone, including parents. Cool. Yeah, so that's it. Those were all my questions. Okay. Awesome. Thank awesome. you. Thank you.